All right, guys. So here we're going to be investigating uh, this macroscopic quantity that we call specific heat. Now we talked about specific heat for solids and liquids, and uh, for example, for water, we talked about you know specific heat also for the steam, but uh, we kept it kind of simple, especially for gases in you know previous sections. Here, what we're going to do, we're going to talk about how for gases, for ideal gases, undergoing a process. There, let's say there's a change in temperature, uh, the specific heat depends on the specific type of process that we have. So, and specific heat can actually change for the process when you change in the temperature. Let me give you an example. So let's say we have a PV diagram. Okay, so for this PV diagram, let's say we have Initial temperature, let's kind of give it like this, and another temperature like that. Those are the isotherms. So starting from, for example, somewhere over here. So this is our, you know, state, you know, this is our initial state. So our goal is to have, you know, some kind of change in temperature. So some kind of delta T, where this is equal to T final minus T initial. That means we want to go from this first isotherm to the next one. Now, obviously what we have here is, doesn't matter how you go from the first isotherm to the second one, the change in temperature is gonna be exactly the same. So for example, we can go like this to the final state, we can go like that to the final state, let's say, I put it like this, or we can go like that to the final state, right? And and goal is exactly the same, right? Do you have a same change in temperature, same delta T. That means change in internal energy will also be exactly the same, right? So because remember, delta change in internal energy is proportional to change in temperature. Because if we start from this initial state and go to the final state, well, any of these final states is, you know, on the same isotherm means that same change in temperature, means same change in internal energy. But what we know here is, Changing internal energy is a you know is Q and minus work done by the gas, for example, minus work done by the gas. But obviously, what we can see here is for the first, let's say, from initial to F prime, uh, for example, here what we have is this is the amount of work done. For the uh, you know initial to F double prime, this is the amount of work done. For the initial to F triple prime, let's say this is the amount of work done. So there's different amount of work done. Well, if there's different amount of work done, so you can see, right, then Q is equals to changing internal energy plus work done by the gas. Since changing internal energy is exactly the same for every process that I have on the board right there, but the work done is not, that means Q is also not constant, okay? That means the energy Q associated with this type of processes does not have a unique value. And you know that's due to the fact that a specific heat doesn't have a specific value when you're considering you know, ideal gas. Okay. Now for the, assuming that let's say we are not changing what number of moles of the system and thing like that. One thing we're gonna do here, we're gonna concentrate on two specific, you know, let's say processes One is going to be, no. So let me go back here, do my second isotherm. So one of them is going to be like this. So we're going to start from initial and we're going to go to the final like that. So this is my final. And then the next one is going to be like this from initial to final like that. So let's call this F cup or F prime. Well, Hopefully you guys can recognize those type of processes, right? So in one of them, what we have here is there is change in volume, but no change in pressure. In the other one, there's a change in pressure, but no change in, change in volume. That means this one here is isobaric. And this one over here is isovolumetric. Isovolumetric. 
that means we're going to be concentrating on these two, two type of processes. That means going from initial to final. You can see, right, the amount of work done clearly, again, is not the same because, for example, for the isovolumetric process, all the work done is zero. Or for the isobaric process, the work done here is the area under the curve. So that means you can see, right, there is already a, a different, you know, amount of hue, right, for the isobaric compared to isovolumetric. Okay. Now, that means one thing we can say here is, so this Q, which is the, the heat added or removed, right, for example, is then going to be in terms of written, like in terms of the, this is the this is, this is ideal gas, right? We're going to write it in terms of like number of moles. So this is going to be written in terms of, for example, for the um, going from the initial to final for the isobaric process. So this will be written in terms of a specific heat at the constant pressure. So this is going to be known as a molar specific heat. Specific heat at constant pressure. So pressure is constant. Okay. So the molar specific heat at constant pressure. Well, then for the, you know, let's say, let's call this like, let's say process one, process two. For the process two, then going from initial to final prime, well, that's an isovolumetric, you know, uh, process. And what we have here for that, well, clearly the volume is constant. So then what we have here is that Q for that process is given in terms of CV, which is molar specific heat at constant volume. Let me can cancel, you know, get rid of that. So this is again, so it's a molar specific heat when volume is constant, okay. And one thing we will see here is those values even, right? So this CV and CP, they even those two values are not gonna be equal to one another. And you can see that again, directly from this equation, right? So for the isobaric, there is a work done. There is a work done. So that means, you know, for example, if I'm writing the, you know, Q for the, when isobaric process is happening, that means that the pressure is constant, volume is changing, and that means there's a work done. So you have the internal energy plus certain amount of work done by the gas. That means Q for this process one, right, um, is internal energy plus work done. Well, for process two is just internal energy and no work done. Since internal energy is exact, changing internal energy is exactly the same for process one and process two, then you can see, right, then, you know, Q for, you know, process one is higher than for the process two. Okay. That means what we're going to see here is CP will be greater than uh, CV. Okay. So CP always going to be greater than CV because of the no amount, no work done by the, for the isovolumetric process. Uh, for the, you know, process two. So Q is only equals to the change in internal energy where for the, you know, isobaric process, the Q is equals to internal energy plus work done. And this is a, you know, expansion, right? So there's a work done, you know, let's say by the gas. Uh, so Q here is higher. So now what we do here is we then write the, the Q in terms of then uh, those molar specific heats. So we have then, let's say you can think of like, let's say in this case, this will be the process one, where Q1 is equals to number of moles times, you know, molar specific heat at constant pressure times change in temperature, where Q2 then can be here written as number of moles times specific molar specific heat at constant volume times delta T. So that's why uh, this equation where Q is equals to MC delta T, this is mostly used for the um, let's say solid and liquid. When we talk the whole want ideal gas, then we have to consider, you know, uh, let's say using this equation because as you can see, right, for the for the ideal gas, you know, for example, isobaric or isothermal, you know, isovolumetric processes basically give you different amount of Q. So we use then this specific, you know, specific heats, um, kind of like specific to type of process 
isobaric compared to isovalometric. All right, so here's a table of those values. So uh, one thing we will see here is, remember, as I mentioned, right, specific heat at constant pressure is greater than molar specific heat at constant volume. So when you take their, you know, uh, difference, Cp minus Cv, one of the things we're going to see here is that when you take that difference, we're always going to get um, that constant R. That means if I, if I do Cp minus Cv, we're always going to get the constant R, okay, which, you know, we will see in a little bit. But the idea here is, let's say you have a table with values of the specific heat. Also, make sure that you see that there's a monatomic, and then you have diatomic and triatomic gases, and then you have, you can see, right, we have CV and CP, for example, for helium. And CP, you can see, is greater than uh, CV. And for any, let's say, any type of substance that we're considering, you know, molar specific heat at constant pressure is higher than the molar specific heat at the constant volume. Okay. So then you can see that, um, so these are the specific heats, actually, and these are molar specific heats. So um, in terms of what we have here is, you can see, right, if you look at their difference here for the molar specific heats, Cp minus Cv, their difference almost always gives you 1.99 calorie per mole Kelvin. So you can see, right, doesn't matter if it's monatomic, diatomic, or triatomic, most of their, you know, difference between Cv and Cp for the, for the substance always gives you uh, roughly, like, let's say this, this, you know, difference of two. Okay. Also, one very important, you know, um, quantity here is the ratio Cp over Cv, which is given as 1.67 if it's monatomic, regardless of any type of substance we have, 1.4 if it's diatomic, and roughly about 1.3 if it's triatomic. So generally, we're going to keep it things that is monatomic or diatomic. So we're not really going to go into much more complex stuff. So, uh, but, uh, you know, make sure that you understand, you know, this this gamma over here, right, uh, is given in terms of, uh, let's say, 1.67 for any type of monatomic, and um, then 1.4 for any type of diatomic. So this is basically dimensionless, you know, ratio, right? So this is a ratio of molar specific heats. It's a dimension, dimensional ratio that we, you know, we use this Greek gamma for. And, but, you know, we're going to see that that ends up being, you know, uh, let's say, useful when we talk about, you know, some certain, certain type of processes. Okay. So um, let's look at here in terms of then, um, for example, uh, for a gas in a constant volume process, as I mentioned, right? So if it's a constant volume, so when you have this, the, uh, you know, plus the, the work done uh, by the gas, because it's a constant volume, which is, you know, isovolumetric, the work done here is zero. There is no work done. That means QV is equal to the delta E internal. Okay, so then we can represent Q with a subscript V indicating that this is when the volume is constant. So QV is just equal to the change in internal energy. But for the constant pressure is, as I said, right, internal energy plus work done by the gas, which can be written as P delta V. All right, since it's a work done by the gas, so it's just a you know positive P times delta V. And then comparing these two processes for a monatomic gas, um, we can see that their difference is basically going to be equals to R. And then we can do that by looking at that, um, let's say, since QV is equals to change in internal energy. So if I come back to this equation, I can say that, okay, so QP is equals to change in internal energy, which is basically equals to QV. So I can say that this is, you know, a QV. Then, then plus P times delta V. Okay. Now, what I have here is the, the QP here is N times CP delta T. QV here is N times CV times delta T plus, well, PDV, uh, P times delta V is then, you know, using ideal gas law equation, I can then relate this as NR times delta T, right? NR times delta T. Well, using that, then I can say, all right, so number of moles can cancel everywhere. Change in temperature then can cancel everywhere. Then what I get here is I get Cp is equals to Cv plus R 
or if I move the CV to the other side, then you get this, the difference of CP minus CV is equals to R. That's why we get this, you know, there's difference equals to R because of the, you know, let's say when we apply everything, we assume that since the number of moles is exactly the same, since the change in temperature is exactly the same, that means change in internal energy exactly the same, this simplifies into just, you know, their difference equals to the gas constant R. Okay, and you can see right, which is consistent with measured values, with experiments, and also in terms of, you can see right, so this is a difference which is roughly always going you know, to be equal to uh, around two. All right, so in addition, you can still remember, so the change in internal energy for um, thermodynamic processes only depends on the change in temperature. And we have uh, looked at that before, and we know that this is equal to three halves and R delta T. So this is one of the ways to relate the change in internal energy into temperature. Well, three halves and R delta T, so we know that change in internal energy as we talked about, it's also equals to QV because this is the isovolumetric process where the work done is zero. So that means equals to QV. That means those two are equals to one another as well. So those two is equals to one another as well. That means three halves NR delta T is equals to N CV delta T. So this is when we can then cancel the number of moles, cancel the change in temperature from both sides. And then what we end up with, we can write CV is equals to three halves times R. So that's kind of, you know, what we have. So, you know, um, CV equals three halves times R. And that's for the, um, in terms of a measurement, right? That, or, or, the, or the quantity also agreement, in agreement uh, with, uh, with measurements. All right, so this is generally uh, for the monatomic gas. So let's say if, you, if you're talking about in terms of three halves, this is for the monatomic gas. Okay. So, and uh, because this is, this has like, let's say, I uh, remember three degrees of freedom. Um, if you kind of, you know, consider uh, in terms of like, let's say other ones, right? So let's say the, the vibration and rotation come into play, then these values can slightly change. But then also what one of the things we have here is if I'm then considering, for example, the equation for the CP. So remember CP was equals to then CV plus R. So then for the same monatomic gas, so this is three half R, then plus another R. So we get five over two R. So then this will be for the uh, for the CP, which is the molar specificated con constant pressure um, for, the, for the monatomic gas. Okay. So generally, like, let's say if we do this calculation, um, we should get 20.8 joules per mole, you know, degree, you know, per mole Kelvin. Okay. So kind of like that's what we have. Then this gamma, what was the ratio, right, of those monatomic, uh, let's say for the monatomic gas, if I take this ratio, which is always CP over CV, then we can see that if I do then five over two R divided by three over two R, so one halves cancel out, R's cancel out, and we just get five over three. And then we can see then the gamma here is equals to 1.67. Okay, so that's why, regardless what type of substance it is. So if you go back and look at the table, you can see, right, Gamma is 1.67 for uh, monatomic gas. That's because, you know, CP happened to be three halves R, CV is five over two R, and the ratio ends up giving you 1.67. Okay, so that's why this, this kind of like over here represents in terms of this, um, what we call equal partition of energy, uh, which means that once you are going from the more you know, simple monatomic gas to like diatomic gas and triatomic gas, you know, your, your system increases in complexity. So monatomic, you have only X, Y, Z. That means it can only move in X, Y, Z direction. So you have three degrees of freedom. For the diatomic then, uh, it can also, uh, you can also add two degrees of freedom for the rotation. So you can, right, can, can like 
uh, go like this or rotate like that. So that means sort of like a horizontal circle or a vertical circle, depending on if it's rotating with respect to this axis or that axis. So you can have like two different rotation. Uh, it can also have a vibration, which is assuming that because it's diatomic, right? That you have two, you know, two atoms together uh, bounded by some kind of, you know, uh, intermolecular force, but that force is sort of like a spring-like and they can kind of like go back and forth relative to one another. So there's like a vibrate, right? Relative to one another. So they can't really escape each other, but they can just kind of vi vibrate back and forth relative to one another. Which means then from here, we can like sort of like, let's say increase the, the uh, this degrees of freedom for our, uh, our system. And this diagram nicely represents that. So if you're looking at, you know, the, the how the CV changes in terms of um, as a function of temperature, right? Uh, one of the things we can see here is, let's say for any, any type of substance, even, even if it's, let's say, um, a diatomic, even for it to be able to have a rotational kinetic energy and vibrational kinetic energy, the, you know, it requires a high temperature. So you can see, right? So for example, up until about this temperature, so your system can only have um, translational kinetic energy, which means that uh, the energy here is just X, Y, Z. So it's three, three degrees of freedom, okay? And uh, CV here is, will be equal to, you know, three halves R, okay? So then um, one thing we have here at a higher temperature, so we call it, you know, mode of vibration, right? Or rotation, so like degree of freedom. So then you can say the total internal energy is shared equally among the active degrees of freedom, each accounting for one half KT or one half NRT. You know, so then the actual measurements show more complicated situations. So for this temperature, then you have translational kinetic energy for your system to have, you know, let's say you can say there's sort of like a transition where then you can have uh, increase of temperature gives you then um, sort of like, let's say ability to start rotating as well. Then you have then enough energy here to have a rotational kinetic energy as well. So then it becomes five over two R and then what you have here is that there's also now vibrational kinetic energy. So for, for vibrational kinetic energy, then you can have seven over two R. Okay, so that means this is basically in terms of, um, as you can see, right, you, you need to reach a really high temperature in order to be able to, you know, also account for those type of, you know, uh, those type of energies into your system. So you have translational, rotational and kinetic energies, and you can see, right, so um, what you have here, this is the R, so like, let's say then you have then 2R, 3R, 4R, right? For all of them in terms of how things change based on the temperature change. All right, so then something like that for repartition, you know, energy, right? Can also be applied for solids. Um, that uh, you can see that for solids at the high temperature, CV is approximately 3R. So, um, and Solids technically then you can think of like, let's say they have uh, three energies in terms of kinetic energy, three degrees of freedom in terms of kinetic energy. But you can also think of like them having um, three degrees of freedom due to the vibrational potential energy for each atom. And this quantity, right? So this 3R is, is known as Dulong Petit. So it's a relatively famous sort of expression. So Dulong Petit. Okay. And in terms of then, so this is basically this, this you know, 3R, right, uh, for CV. Okay. So this is basically for the, for the solids. But we're not really going to work too much with the solids, but it's also interesting to see sort of like, let's say how um, at the, you know, at the higher temperatures, right, that, you know, some, some of them can, you know, reach that, uh, uh, let's say, uh, about six calorie, right, so like, let's say, uh, in terms of the, the the molar specific heat, right? So a uh, six calorie per mole Kelvin, and some of them require much higher temperature to actually reach that. All right, so we talked about adiabatic isothermal, um, isovolumetric processes quite a lot, but we didn't really talk about adiabatic so much. All right, so remember the adiabatic process is the process where we look at you know, change in internal energy, where this is Q minus W, which is work done by the gas, 
But this is the process where, you know, if I look at it in terms of like, let's say differential form, because one of the things is about the adiabatic process is sometimes it happens very fast. So we can look at it in terms of like, let's say DE internal equals, let's say DQ minus DW. So we can sometimes it's, you know, better to represent it in terms of this differential form, because again, it happens like relatively fast. So that's why the, you know, let's say heat doesn't have time to escape or, you know, enter the system. But this process specifically where then the Q equals zero. So you can say like DQ equals zero. So if you take that this to be zero, then you end up with this, right? For the adiabatic expansion, you know, DE internal equals negative P dV. And again, the specific thing about the adiabatic process is there is no heat transfer out of the system or into the system. All right, so, and since then dQ equals zero, we can look at it in terms of this relationship where the change in internal energy uh, can be related to the, you know, specific heat, molar specific heat at constant volume. And it's a valid, you know, um, representation because uh, the change in, you know, the internal energy, remember, is a function of temperature only. So that means I can say that this dE internal is equal to, oh, there you go. So it's equals to NC, NCV delta T. That means that I can say then, then, you know, um, NCV delta T for uh, for this term over there. And let's say if I take this one and move it to the left, so it becomes then plus P delta V. So not delta V, like let's say DV, and then this equals to then zero. All right. So another thing that we do here is, for example, um, a lot of times we, when we talk about adiabatic, you know, equations, we try to like, let's say, find a way of eliminating delta T. Okay, and we can do that um, if I, so technically we can, can, since temperature also, right? So I can write in terms of DT. So if I take this, you know, uh, PV equals NRT equation, if I take this PV equals NRT equation and then differentiate this equation. So the differentiate of the ideal gas law equation. So this one over here will then end up using the product rule will be PDV plus VDP equals NRDT. So then if I then solve for DT over here, then I can say that this is PDV plus v, VDP divided by NR. And then for example, then I, when I go to this equation over here, I can substitute for that. So NCV, then I have PDV plus VDP uh, over NR then plus PDV equals zero. That means you can see, right, my expression now has no DT. Okay, that means, you know, I did a substitution. So then if I, you know, kind of like do some algebra over here, our equation will look like that form over that. So it's gonna be the ratio of CP over CV times PDV plus VDP equals zero. So from that, we can then define that ratio, right? Define that ratio you know, to be this um, gamma, which is the, the ratio of CP over uh, CP over CV. Okay, that means you know then we can write this in terms of then, uh, let's say, dP over P plus gamma dV over V equals zero, and then pretty much you know um, you can you can say then you know let's say. dp over p equals negative gamma dv over v and then basically integrate both sides and eventually what we're going to see here is integration then will give us these results where pv times gamma will give us constant okay that's because when when, I, when we do this you know let's say uh, integration you can see right it's pv over p or dv over v so uh, we're pretty much going to get you know ln p then plus let's say uh, gamma times ln v gonna be equal to zero, okay? So then, you know, from here, I can say then it's ln um, p times v. And let's say from here, let's say this is p times v gamma equals zero, okay? So that means, you know, it can be simplified pretty much to that. So that's why one of the things we have here is in order for this, ln of PV gamma to be equal zero, PV gamma should be, you know, a constant, okay? 
That means that's why what we have here is uh, in terms of then this equation, PV equals constant. And the gamma here is given in terms of CP over CP over CV. Okay, that means this is, you know, sort of like, let's say this is actually, uh, sorry, so equals to zero is equals to constant. Like that, all right. So let's look at then an example here. So we have a cylinder that contains three moles of helium gas at a temperature of 300 Kelvin. Um, and so basically you have some, you know, ideal gas here, which is, you know, helium gas. And we're given the three mole, which is the, the number of moles that of the gas. And the, we're given the temperature of initial as 300 Kelvin. Now, if the gas is heated at a constant volume, how much energy must be transferred um, uh, must be transferred by heat to the gas for its temperature to increase to 500 Kelvin. Okay, that means we are looking at in terms of um, increasing the temperature to 500 Kelvin, and we want to know how much uh, of the you know transferred by the gas, right? Time of energy will be transferred by the gas, and because it's a constant volume, we know that the only way that energy, you know, internal energy can increase, which increases temp you know temperature, is due to the fact that um, you will have a heat entered. So because it's Q, you know, uh, minus work done by the gas, but because it's constant volume, so this is just equals to Q. So the delta E internal is equals to Q. All right, so, but this is Q at the constant volume. So that means we're talking about, you know, uh, this Q to be CV, uh, QV, right? So then it's N CV delta T, okay? So we're given that this is three moles. Then we're given that um, uh, in terms of like CV, right? So it's a helium gas. So we have to uh, look at in terms of uh, what is the CV for the helium gas and just 12.5 joules per mole Kelvin. And then time change in temperature, which is, you know, um, 500 minus 300. Okay. So then we can calculate this to be 7.5 times 10 to the three joules. Okay, basically 7, 7, 7, 7,500 joules. Okay. Part B says how much energy must be transferred by heat to gas at the constant pressure to raise the temperature to 500 Kelvin. That means basically same thing, you know, uh, but at the constant constant pressure. Okay. So this just to show you that you know, that in terms of how there's no unique value, right? Because we're still doing the same change in, temp change in temperature, change in internal energy. But for example, here, if I do CP, it's gonna be N CP Delta T. So this is then three moles times then a specific, um, mole specific at constant pressure. And that's 20.8 joules per mole Kelvin. And then times 500 minus 300. So here we will get 12.5 times 10 to the three joules. That means we go from 7.5 to 12.5 times 10 to the three, basically 12,000 compared to about 7,000, like, you know, give or take. That means you can see, right? Always QP will be greater than uh, QV. That means amount of energy that you will have um, you have to add, right? Uh, always going to be greater um, for, 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 let's say, um, isobaric processes, right? All right, so here's one more example. At air at 20 degrees Celsius in the cylinder of a diesel engine is compressed from an initial pressure of 1 atm and the volume of 800 cubic centimeters to a volume of 60 cubic centimeters. Assume air behaves as an ideal gas with the gamma equals 1.4 and compression is adiabatic. Okay. So uh, find the final pressure and the temperature of air. Okay. That means, you know, we're given the initial temperature, right? So we're given initial temperature. So, uh, and we have then um, initial pressure is 1 atm initial volume is 800 cubic centimeter. And then we have then the final volume. Okay, so those are the volumes that we're given. So let's write it down. So um, P 
let's say P1, we can write P1 is equals to one ATM. Then V1 is equals to 800 cubic centimeters. Okay. So the final volume here is 60 cubic centimeters. We're also given that gamma is equals to 1.4. And then initial temperature is 20, uh, 20 degrees Celsius, which is basically, uh, you know, 20 plus 273, so 293 Kelvin. Okay. So those are the values we're given. Now, in terms of then, um, what we have here is part A is asking to find the final pressure. The final, to find the final pressure and knowing that this is adiabatic compression, right? Uh, we can then use this equation where P, P1 V1 gamma is equals to P2 V2 gamma. Okay, so we can basically use this equation. And from here, then I can rearrange where I can say then this is P2, which is the one I want, is equals to then V1 gamma over V2 gamma times P1. Or I can say that this is just V1 over V2 gamma, the, you know, the quantity, uh, then times P1. All right, so then here I have V1. I don't even have to convert anything because it's a ratio. So it's 800 cubic centimeters divided by V2, which is 60 cubic centimeters. That's why units cancel out times gamma, which is 1.4 to the power of gamma, then times pressure one, which is basically one ATM. Okay, so then the pressure two here is 37.6 ATM. All right, so again, so because we know it's adiabatic, I could then use this equation over here. All right, so part B is asking, use the ideal gas law to find the final temperature, okay. So assuming that number of moles doesn't, you know, doesn't change, right? So that means, you know, um, we're not given, but assuming that, you know, N1 is equals to N2. So since I have, you know, T1, I have P1, V1, V2, and, you know, let's say P2, right? I can then just go ahead and use this uh, relationship of the initial state to the final state where the number of moles is constant. This was, remember, P1, uh, P1 times V1 over T1, then this is equals to P2 times V2 over T2. Okay, so I can basically relate them with this um, because remember, so, right? So P1 V1 equals NR T1, and this is P2 V2 equals NR T2. If I divide both sides by T2 here, and then both sides by T1 here, then this you know, you can see, right, this NR, quantity NR, is the same for both of them, and it's equal to then the ratio of P1, V1 over T1, and also P2, V2 over T2. So that means those ratios are also equal to one another. Then from here, then I can solve for the T2. Right, it's just solve for T2, uh, where I can say then T2 is equals to P2, V2 times T1 divided by P1, V1. Okay, so then from there, I can see again, there's a ratio. So I don't need to necessarily convert anything. So P2 was 37.6 ATM. V2 was uh, 60 cubic centimeters. Temperature one was 200, negative 293 Kelvin divided by pressure one, which is one ATM and volume one, which is 800 cubic centimeters. Okay, so the units cap cubic centimeters cancel out, ATM cancel out. And the only thing is the Kelvin. So T2 is equals to 553 degrees Celsius. Okay. So, well, let me actually do it like this. It's equals to uh, 826 Kelvin. Then that's equals to uh, uh, 553 degrees Celsius. Okay. But the idea here is, you know, important thing to see here is that you have a, you know, increase in temperature which you should, you know, you should remember, right? That's kind of like what we have, right? So for the diagram for PV, for the PV diagram, remember, so you have, here's one isotherm and here's another isotherm. And during the adiabatic compression, 
compression means your volume changes. That means you, let's say if you're here, remember, uh, in order for the volume change, right? So you're gonna have to go something like that, okay? Which means you're gonna go to a higher, you know, higher isotherm. That means this is your, you know, state one, this is your state two, you will then be increasing temperature because uh, if your pressure increases, which it did, right? Pressure increased from, um, from one to 37.6, that means you're basically going such that the adiabatic compression decreases your volume, but increases your pressure and it has to increase the temperature. Okay, in this case, that means whenever there is a adiabatic expansion, your temperature decreases. Adiabatic compression, your temperature increases. All right, so the, the last thing we have in this chapter um, is about the mechanism of the heat transfer. So we know that uh, basically we can transfer heat from one object to another or from one system to another or from one side of the system to another side of the system. But we haven't talked about, let's say, how exactly it's done. So now we're going to talk about three different mechanisms that can be used to, um, to make that, you know, let's say, uh, let's say the, the energy flow. Uh, there are three different ways. It's a conduction, convection, and radiation. And one of the things that we're going to do here is pretty much look at it in terms of how each type of, you know, uh, let's say, you know, conduction, convection, radiation, different from one another. And uh, let's say calculate the, you know, or give you the equation that you can use to calculate the rate at which the energy will be transferred. So let's say mostly we're going to be looking at in terms of heat flow. Heat flow means that the rate at which the energy goes from one end to other, or from, you know, let's say one object to another object and thing like that. So for example, here, suppose you have um, a long uniform rod uh, that has length L, right? So let's say you have this rod over here that has length L and um, let's say it's thermally insulated so that energy cannot escape by heat from its surface, except it ends. You can say the ends are open to two reservoirs. So it's open to the, or connected to the uh, reservoir, hot reservoir on the left end and the cold reservoir on the right end. So we have then temperature T1 and T2, and we can assume that T1 is greater than T2. So that's why it's hotter reservoir. So uh, one thing we're gonna see here is, you know, uh, the temperature being higher on the left side will always then lose energy to the reservoir at the, you know, at the lower temperature. So then the energy, right, you can say right, heat will flow from hot to cold. And then we can see that if I take then this, you know, uh, this rod, this uniform rod having this cross-sectional area A and then length L. And then what we have here is that there's a, you know, this rate at which, let's say dQ dt, right? The rate at which this heat will transfer from hot reservoir to cold reservoir is proportional to change in temperature, the thing like temperature, temperature difference or like temperature difference between them. So let me do it like this. So uh, it's always going to be like T hot minus T cold. It's always going to be like that, you know, the temperature difference between them. And then divide it inversely proportional to the length of the conductor. Right? So it's, you know, in, in inversely proportional to that length, but, you know, also directly proportional to the area. So that's why. So what you have here is that it's a T1 minus T2 it's always like hot minus cold over length and then times area. So then the, when you go from proportionality sign to equal sign, you introduce a constant and that's the constant that we have, okay? So that constant is um, basically, you can think of like is, 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 is a constant that is not a function of temperature, but it's a constant that kind of represents um, the type of material, right? That we're dealing with, okay? So it's sort of like a, a temperature grade, you know, like let's say the the, um, gradient, right? So like, let's say in terms of how the system is moving, you know, from one end to another end with, for this specific type of, uh, let's say, uh, conductor, you can think like that. So in this table, you can see then this value for K, again, we call it thermal conductivity. So this value for K, and you can see that it depends on the type of substance we're dealing with, silver, copper, aluminum, steel, right? So in a way, it's not temperature, you know, dependent because if you have, let's say, 100 degrees Celsius for the TH and uh, let's say, you know, um, for the T cold, let's say 20 degrees Celsius, the, this K then changes depending on 
what is the medium that you are using to you know the the, the conduct energy from one end to another okay also the you know important thing to understand right so when you're dealing with the conduction we're assuming that this rod is in physical contact with hot and cold reservoirs that's why the conduction is always requires some kind of physical contact between you know let's say the the conductor or whatever it is right that energy is going through uh, and those hot and cold reservoirs it could be let's say a window right so you have a window one of those windows and then the window basically has air outside you know let's say maybe like i don't know hot air outside and uh cold air inside when it's summer right when it's summer it's really hot outside and kind of cool inside then what you have is that your window uh basically transfer energy right the hot air from outside can go through the through your window into inside if your window is let's say thin and thing like that if it's type of material that allows the energy to go but generally the windows are made of such material that they really slow down the the energy transfer from hot outside into cold inside or during the winter right when it's hot inside and cold outside the energy stays inside your room but obviously if you turn off your heater right eventually your room will get cold why because you know as good as the windows are energy will still leak through you know uh, and go out you know go outside and as the as you lose energy right the room inside basically will get cold all right so then again so those are the values for the thermal conductivity you don't have to memorize any of those values but you know you can see that in terms of material with large k are conductors because the conductors are the material that conduct everything well conduct you know electricity well heat well sound well and things like that so those are what we call conductors and insulators basically prevent, you know, uh, let's say the motion of energy or electricity and things like that. So we call them insulators. So that means, you know, the, the window glass is a good insulator because you don't, you know, um, you don't want it, right? So imagine if your windows were made of, you know, uh, a metal, right? Let's say, I don't know, or copper or something like that. Then, you know, not only it will heat up, it also will transfer a lot of energy into your house. So that means during the summer when it's really hot outside and you have, I don't know, let's say copper windows, yeah, you, you, you're inside your house is going to be almost as hot as outside. All right, so let's look at an equa you know, example then using that equation. So uh, remember, so that equation that we looked at is basically the rate at which energy is transferred, which we call power, right? So we have a window of area of two uh, meters square is glazed with a glass of thickness four millimeter. Okay, so the window is in the wall of a house and the outside temperature is 10 degrees Celsius. The temperature inside the house is 25 degrees Celsius. That means we can see, right? So there's a difference in temperature. And then the window, um, basically uh, the glass, right? Exactly, you know, in contact with both sides. So that's right. You know, if any type of energy is going through one end to other, it's through that, you know, through that are, you know, through the glass. So that's why what we have here is the window is transferring energy through conduction. Okay. So we're given temperature hot and cold, we're given uh, the area two meters square, right? So we can say that, so the area here is two meters square. We're given the length, which is uh, four times 10 to the negative three millimeters, uh, three meters. We're given T cold, which is 10 degrees Celsius. We're given T hot, which is 25 degrees Celsius. And we wanna calculate part A, how much energy transfers through the window by heat in one hour. Okay, so which means that if I use this equation where delta Q over delta T, remember this is basically what we call power. Power is just basically delta Q delta T. And then this equals to then conduct uh, the, the thermal conductivity, right? K then times area, then times T hot minus T cold, then divided by the, the length, okay. So that means one thing we can do here is we can use it to calculate, let's say the power first. So basically this is what you can say that this is basically the power. Okay. So the conductivity, um, if you know, let's say um, we can use it in terms of Zero point eight watt 
per meter degree Celsius, then times we can get it from the table, right? Then times two meters squared, the area, then we have the temperature hot, 25 minus temperature cold, 10. Then divide by the length, which is four times 10 to negative three meters. So we can calculate the power to be six times 10 to the three watts. Then I can say power is equals to delta Q delta T. And then from here, I can solve for delta Q to be then power times delta T. That means it's six times 10 to the, um, six times 10 to the three Watts times one hour, which is basically, uh, so you can say one hour, that is uh, 60 minutes, um, sorry. One hour is 60 minutes, but we write it like this. And uh, one minute is 60 seconds. Okay, so because remember this is power, which is joules per second. So that means the time has to be converted into, into seconds. Then the Q here is equals to two times 10 to the seven joules. That means um, basically roughly 20 million joules of energy being transferred in one hour. That's a lot of times, but you know, uh, it's basically one hour time, so. Um, all right, so then it says, uh, if electrical energy costs 12 cents per kilowatt hour, and the kilowatt hour basically is the unit of energy, right? So remember, so watt times hour, so what kilowatt hour is basically energy unit. Then for part B, we can calculate um, how much does the transfer of energy of this much, right? Cost, you know, to replace uh, the, with electrical heating. Okay, so um, what we can do then uh, in terms of here, we can, let's say, calculate to see how much of that uh, kilowatt hour we have, right? So Q is equals to P delta T. So six times 10 to the three Watts. Let me see. Times one hour, because we want, we want kilowatt hour, right? So. This will give us then six times 10 to the three watt hour, which is then can be converted six, 10 to the three is kilowatt hour, right? So, so that means we have, what we have is just basically six kilowatt hour. And it's asking how much does the transfer energy cost to replace with uh, electrical heating? So then from here, we can just basically do the calculation. Right. Maybe let's do it here. So what we can do, we can say, all right, so six kilowatt hour where uh, each kilowatt hour is 12 cents. Then we can calculate this to get 72 cents. Okay. That means, you know, it's gonna cost us 72 cents uh, to basically, let's say if we had a heater that would pump this much energy, we'd have to pay, you know, 72, 72 cents for that. Uh, well, instead, you know, we get it for free, right? By just having the sun, you know, sunlight, which is free, right? To enter our house and heat up our, you know, let's say apartment. All right. So another thing we have here is um, you can see, right? So there's this uh, for building materials, right? Um, our me what we do, we measure using R values rather than thermal conductivity, which is R is equals to just basically L over K, that ratio. So, um, and where L is the thickness of the material. Okay. So you can see that R value is kind of like a combination of um, British units and things like that. So I don't necessarily use it too much, but you know, you can see, right? The units are feet square times hour times degree Fahrenheit over BTU. So, and the thickness and everything given in terms of inches. So you have glasses, you know, you know one eighth of an inch, brick, three, three half of an inch and so on and so forth. So. But you know you can kind of like look at it in terms of this r value as well which you can go back to the previous equation just you can see right it's just l over k the length over the thermal conductivity the next is basically the what we call convection so the convection is then uh, the type of energy flow right that doesn't require any type of you know uh, contact so things like this. So for example, if you have a, a fireplace or something like that, or a, or a toaster or something like that, right? So 
imagine like, probably you one time or another would have your like would, would warm your hand right um just basically place it whatever above the fire or above the toaster and then eventually like let's say you will heat uh, feel the heat right that because air in a in a fireplace or the toaster right warms up and expands and the, you know the density of this air basically decreases and uh, above it and then air the hot air rises up so this hot air then basically warms your hands as it flows by. That means this is basically the, the motion of hot gases, right? Um, let's say, or, you know, the liquids and things like that, but something that kind of like circulate like this. And the, one of the things we have about this uh, convection is that it's very, um, let's say, unpredictable, right? It's because it's constantly, let's say, the, you know, flowing and things like that. So uh, here you can see, right? So you have a, uh, the hot source, the, the hot reservoir, warms up the, the air over here, which becomes hot, then hot air goes up, the, the colder one, you know, cool, you know, colder one basically goes down uh, because let's say the hot expands and the density decreases, and the density decreases, basically, um, uh, let's say it goes up, right? Remember in the, in the liquids, you know, the, the den higher, lower density, let's say portion of the water will go up because it's hot, colder water, which has a higher density will, you know, will sink, but then it will warm up again because it's cold, you know, as it gets, you know, in this region, it's gonna then warm up, it's gonna go up. So then you basically have sort of like a circulation like this. And that's also what, you know, what you have in, in terms of like, uh, let's say your uh, radiator and your, you know, heater and thing like that inside your house. So that air basically constantly circulates, hot air goes in, cold air comes out, and then basically it warms up and then pushes inward. So, so you have sort of like, let's say this, you know, natural or forced, right? where both of them sort of like, let's say, you know, um, forced in terms of like, you know, in your house, right? You kind of like, um, you know, that's called like a sort of like a force source. Uh, but, you know, this is sort of like a convection. It's just in terms of what we have here is that energy transfer by movement of warm substance, sort of like, let's say. And um, you can see the lateral convection, right? Resulting from differences in density. So let's say the air in a toaster and thing like that, or uh, the sun, right? Because the surface of the sun uh, constantly keeps the almost a constant temperature because the the gases when they radiate energy they basically cool down and they say sink so the hotter gases a, a little bit deeper right at the surface below the surface go, go up that means you know what you have here let's say this is the sun's surface so the gases over here constantly sort of like circulating like this that means any gas that radiates energy then cools down comes down the hot goes up that means any any gas and replaced by the hot ones constantly. So that means it, it maintains more or less constant temperature. So we don't again we don't really do much with that because as I said, the it, it's very turbulent. It's kind of unpredictable and sort of like the equations of that look beyond the scope of this class. The radiation on the other hand is the form of energy transfer that um, kind of like let's say we can say right. So the energy transfer we see from the sun, if you stand close to fire, most of the heat you feel is radiation as well. Um, that means radiation, not let's say not above it, but next to it. So because above the fire, what you what you feel here is the combination of radiation and con uh, convection, because then let's say the warm air also, but let's say if you're on the, on, the, on the side of the fire, you can still feel the heat, but it's not the air, right? Air comes up, goes up, doesn't go, let's say sideways, but you still feel the heat because that's the radiation. So then you can see things like radiation is uh, sort of like a type of energy, right? That, you know, uh, is due to the fact that they have some kind of, you know, temperature. Any object due to their temperature radiate energy. So they, they you know, let's say the glowing is an example of radiation of energy. So for example, humans also glow because we are, you know, we have high, high temperature, right? We're hot, we glow. It just, the glowing of, you know, our, our glowing, our radiation, you know, transfer is invisible to us because we glow in infrared. Infrared is not uh, sensitive, you know, we, our eyes are not sensitive to infrared, we, we can't really see that. But in any case, so um, light bulb, for example, when it radiates energy, uh, you can see it. And how the light bulb radiates energy? Well, it's the particles entering the, the, the filament convert some of their potential energy into heat energy, and then the, the light bulb becomes very hot and then because it's very hot, it radiates that heat energy. And that heat energy is basically what we see 
for the light bulb, it happened to be in a visible spectrum. So we can see it glowing. That's why we can see the sun glowing and things like that. But all the objects around us, we don't see them glowing, but they are because they are anything that has a temperature, let's say above, you know, uh, absolute value technically glows depending on how high the temperature is. Anyways, the equation here is again, this is the power, the rate at which energy is transferred. And this is proportional to a couple of constants. So the one of the constant is the, what we call emissivity. So this E here is the emissivity. And uh, emissivity basically is in terms of the constant that is between zero and one. So it's a constant that between zero and one. And uh, sigma here is the Stefan Boltzmann constant. Okay. Uh, area here is the area of the region that let's say, or for example, it's, let's say it's the sun. So then it's the surface area of the, of the sun. Okay. So then the T here is T to the four, T must be in Kelvin because it's not a changing temperature, it's just a change temperature. So it must be in Kelvin. For the conduction, I can keep the temperature in Celsius because it's Delta T. So the, the difference between the temperatures. So we could keep it in, in terms of the Celsius, which we did in the previous example. But here we have to make sure that it's in Kelvin. Now, sigma here is another Stefan Boltzmann constant. So, uh, so this is actually, you know, Stefan Boltzmann constant for the, uh, for this, you know, uh, radiation. It's 5.67 times 10 to the negative eight watts per square meter, Kelvin to the four. Okay, that means you have two constants, right? The, the Stefan Boltzmann constant and emissivity, which is again, is a number between zero and one. So that, you know, this is something, some information about surface. Black objects have an emissivity near one and the shiny hub, shiny ones have emissivity of almost zero. Okay, so it is the same for absorption. Uh, so we can say, right, a good emitter is an also a good absorber. Most of the object is absorb and emit. All right, so, and also what we have here, you can say, right, if you're in sunlight, the sun's radiation will warm you in general. You will not be perfectly perpendicular to the sun rays because of the, uh, the tilt of, you know, Earth's surface, right? That, I mean, the Earth, you know, the Earth has a little of tilt relative to the sun. So then the sunlight, when it reaches Earth's surface, it's not, you know, let's say exactly above it. It's sort of like at an angle. So then you can say that DQ, the delta Q delta T here is given in terms of this, uh, this number, which is 1000 meter per uh, watts per square meter, right? Uh, so this is basically, you can think of like, let's say this is the value that we use for the, uh, you know, when we're dealing with specifically for the sun's radiation, okay? So then, then tam, times emissivity times A cosine of theta. So that means this number over here specifically used for the, uh, let's say when were you talking about, um, radiation from the from the sun all right so then here in this next slide you can see right what i'm talking about in terms of having the um su the, the the sun and earth right so like there's a little bit of tilt and what you have here is for example so you can see right this is earth in june i don't know if you guys were aware of that but for example june is you, you always associate that with with uh, with summer but it is true if you live in a northern hemisphere. In the southern hemisphere, June is basically winter. Okay, and so for them it's the middle of winter. That's because, to, you know, when, when, you, when you're June, let's say, see, northern hemisphere is facing the sunlight. So you can see like a little bigger picture over here. See that, you know, remember this, the earth is also spinning. So the entire northern hemisphere gets more sunlight than uh, southern hemisphere. To compare to southern hemisphere, that's why during the June, you know, let's say if you live in Los Angeles, which is I think somewhere over here, there is, a, well, it's summer, it's warm, it's summer, and at the same time, for example, in Brazil, or you know, or Chile, it's winter, or in Australia, during during June, it's winter, but then when Earth goes around the sun, let's say six months later in December, you can see. It's the things turn. So the southern hemisphere gets more sun, the northern hemisphere gets less sun. That means December for us is winter. So all the northern hemisphere basically experiencing colder temperature, but then opposite is true for the southern hemisphere. Southern hemisphere then have, you know, a summer for them. 
you know, let's say uh, Australia, uh, Argentina, Brazil, right? You know, Antarctica, right? They all have then uh, summer uh, during December. What we went, when we have winter, they have summer. When we have summer, they have winter. Okay, so that's kind of like what we have. And that's why in terms of, let's say then, this number of tilt is the reason, one of the main reasons that, um, let's say we do have that. We do have seasons, let's say, plus because we have uh, difference in terms of Northern Hemisphere and Southern Hemisphere. All right, guys, that's it for this chapter.